Well, happy 4th of July, guys. Uh, Pastor Ryan here at North Valley Community Church. This, today is going to be a different uh, day. And I uh, uh, want to en- encourage you, uh, if you are, are able to share this, I think this is going to be a very helpful, encouraging, challenging uh, uh, message for us today. Today is all about listening and learning. You know, I recently read a book called The Founding Brothers, The Revolutionary Generation. And I can't help but think of John Adams, who lived from 1735 to July 4th of 1826. Uh, He died at the age of 90, and then he served as a founding father. He was a vice president to George Washington. Uh, He was the second president of the United States. He was married to Abigail Adams, uh, who was an active abolitionist. And she was his most trusted advisor. And I think so timely that his wife plays a critical role in this. And then what's unique about John Adams is as an early president is that he refused to have any slaves. And so did his son, John Quincy Adams, and as a, served as a sixth president. In fact, he spoke out against it. And he said this in 1819, he said that Negro slavery is an evil of colossal magnitude. And then in 1821, he said that slavery is the storm cloud that hangs over our country. And so while our country has much to celebrate and we see that uh, freedom is woven into the Declaration of Independence and these biblical principles of equality for all people are woven into it, that's not always been the case or for an experiential level for our black brothers and sisters in this country. And the 4th of July just doesn't come easy to all to celebrate. For me and my family, for years, we celebrate hot dogs, hamburgers, barbecues, good times, American flags, fireworks, and it's one of the most favorite uh, uh, holidays for our family and for so many Americans. However, I think it's crucial and critical in a time such as this to to listen and to hear about while we have much to be thankful for and freedoms to be uh, uh, grateful for, we still must march on. We have, just as we're fighting this coronavirus, as a pastor and as a, a fellow American, I feel the need we must fight and overcome this virus of sin and racism in our country. And we can do that as we evaluate our hearts and encourage our homes and I think we'll have a better world. And so I believe as a country, we can be far more unified as we do what we're about to do today is pause and listen, as the Apostle James says, is be quick uh, to listen and slow to speak. And so as we will in the coming weeks look into God's word about a biblical foundation and understanding and theology about unity as it relates to race, today what we're going to do is we're going to listen. And we want to, today we have a, such a unique panel. Um, Andy Branch, you serve as an elder here in our church at the highest level of leadership. You've been a trusted friend to me and I and a great uh, overseer in our church. And we're so grateful that you're here today. And then Dresden, uh, she serves in our student ministries and uh, works along our, our student ministry staff and uh, an incredible Young lady, so proud of you and thankful for you. And then we have Ryan McFoy, and he and his wife both have served in North Valley Kids for years, have been with us since the movie theater days. Remember one of the first days I I saw you, and I thought, this is a cool guy. Our only tension was the Raiders and the Cardinals, and uh, still that tension is there today. (laughs) <laughs> and and uh, you've been serving in North Valley Kids for, for, for years, and you and your wife have been a part of our neighborhood group. So glad to have you here today. And then Pastor Ellis, celebrating one year of pastoral ministry at North Valley. You, he is a critical force in this church, oversees all of our guest services, our campus projects, and Godly, incredible, gifted man. So glad to have you guys here. So enough of me sharing and introducing and doing all that. I want to hear, just as we approach this uh, 4th of July season, you know, um, and we face these issues of racism, we want to pause for a moment. Uh, as, as a predominantly white church, and, 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 and start to help us understand more 
from your perspective as an African American, black men and women, how do how have you experienced racism in because so many think maybe it doesn't exist today or it's overplayed or that was back in the slavery days, it's not today. How have you experienced discrimination or racism in your own personal life? And I'll open it up for any of you guys. Well, um, for me, um, something recently that happened, I was actually shopping uh, in a certain part of Arizona and um, came out of the store, uh, walked past a car, and uh, I saw the young lady in the car, and uh, I think we made eye contact. And no sooner I walked past her, I heard a thump. And I'm like, did she just lock her door? <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I just thank God for being a Christian. I did turn around, I looked at her, and I think she looked in her rearview mirror, we made eye contact again, I just shook my head. Mm. That alone just kind of made me know that we are still a long ways away from accomplishing our goal. Mm -hmm. um, and this was just recently. So, you know, it, it, just, it just saddens me to know that here we are in the 21st century and we're still experiencing these type things. Mm -hmm. And you grew up in Detroit, and so you probably saw a lot, but I mean, it's, there's... There's all sorts of stories, I imagine, yeah, with you sure. and your past and, and seeing mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. but there was a, a situation where I went to a mall, and uh, me and a couple of buddies, we wanted to buy a, 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 a wool pea coat. Hmm. And uh, the store we went to was Hudson's, and Hudson's is a kind of an upscale uh, department store. So we went in there and looked around, and, and we were trying on coats and putting them back. And one of my buddies say, you see that security over there? I'm like, yeah. You know, He said, he's following us. I said, no, he's not. So we went over to another area, and sure enough, he came right along with us. And that alone just kind of made me say, come on, fellas, let's get out of here. You know, mm -hmm. to know that we're being followed, and we're just trying to shop, spend our hard-earned money to try to buy something that we want. And again, this was back coming up in high school, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a sad situation, whereas that we have been identified or have the stigma on us that we need to be watched, you know, we steal and this, that, and the other. And uh, it's just a sad, sad time, you know. And, and you told me that you've had to have talks with your son. Yes. On how to be a black man in America. Yes. And when yes. you told me that, I thought, what? Yeah. What? So explain that just for a moment. You know, I, uh, I talked to both my sons and uh, I told them, I said, you know, we're living in a, in a different time now. And I said, I don't want to hear about you know, anything where you were belligerent toward an officer. I said, you have to understand, I know you are your own man, but you need to listen and do what's being asked of you. Because if not, all they have to do is look at the history and see what happened when they tried to be defiant, you know? And so um, I, I know my youngest son, he's a little hard hit, you know, so I had to really talk to him more firmly. But my oldest son, he got it, you know. And uh, their question to me was, well, Dad, why do you think this is, you know? And I told him, I said, I wish I had the answer because I can give a solution, you know. But until the answer is actually you know, brought to us, and we just is just a new way of living now, you know. Um, if they get stopped by the police for whatever reason, these are the things that I ask them to do. You put your hand on the steering wheel, you roll your window down, you shut your vehicle off, you turn off your radio, and then you listen to what it is that the officer has to say, and you be compliant. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you when this thing is over, you know. If it's a matter of getting a ticket, take it, and then drive away. Mm -hmm. We'll deal with it later. But as of any type of defiant and, and response to the way where you'll get them riled up or they rile you up, it can't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just good ethics all around. Yeah. But it's a heightened concern, mm -hmm. I'm sure, as a, as a, as a uh, African-American father yes. in, in today's time. And it's scary. It's yeah. scary. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the stuff is happening, but it can actually be in your own backyard. Yeah. Well, McFoy, you want to share just a little bit from your yes. perspective? Uh, I, I would say the first time I really experienced racism, I had to be in elementary school, my brother in junior high school, and we were walking to the barber shop, and we fit the description of burglars in the area. So they literally had us sit on the curb, handcuffed, and if it wasn't for a friend of uh, the family seeing us, getting out of the car, and sticking up for us, we we don't know what would have happened. Um, they called my parents. My parents came down as well, and they were very, very upset. And 
that was the first talk I had with my dad about how to interact with police officers. Mm -hmm. And going into high school, we continuously had that talk. Every time I went out with friends, we had a procedure of if you get pulled over, make sure your hands are on the steering wheel, don't make sudden moves, yes, sir, no, sir. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the typical, uh, that that was what we did for survival, pretty mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm doing the same thing with my son, and he's five. Mm -hmm. He's very aware of what's going on, and I have to explain these things to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's uncomfortable, but it's not because it's his it's his life. Mm -hmm. um, at stake so mm -hmm. he understands so that's just a little of what I had to deal with mm -hmm. um, but all through school uh, I prim uh, went to white schools mm -hmm. um, primarily uh, just for the fact my dad didn't want us to go to school where we lived and I've been called the n-word multiple times been in multiple fights because mm -hmm. It, it is offensive and it's upsetting. Mm -hmm. um, to this day, I you know I jog down the street and you know people cross the street and walk the other way when they see me jogging down the street. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely present. Yeah, I think I think that is an issue that we that we have got to uh, put our put some effort into as an American culture is the educational issue because I know probably why your father wanted you to get out of those schools is the education wasn't as good in those neighborhoods. So, so you're, it's a challenge and, um, and we've got to figure out how to create better education ar around our country in communities that are, um, uh, are in great need, you know? So, well, thanks for sharing. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Just honestly is from what time I could remember, um, you know, stories my grandfather used to tell, black people just been portrayed as animals or we've been portrayed as robbers or thieves. So, um, like Pastor Ellis, his experience with, you know, the young lady locking her car, you know, that's what we have to deal with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, just from what's been portrayed of black people since the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think it's important to know a little bit about my background. Uh, my mom is a white woman from born and raised in Alabama, and my dad is black from Virginia. Uh, my dad is 80 years old, yay. Uh, my <laughs> mom is in her 70s, so they have been around for a long time. They've been around in, in times where they have had to be separated because of the color of their skin. Uh, my my mom witnessed a, the, a KKK attack on the Freedom Bus Riders just right down the road when she was a little girl um, and remembers it. So they have their own stories and me growing up, uh, there's there was racism in, in the family even. So um, they sheltered me from it a little bit mm -hmm. and I think where I grew up is where I kind of, I had my own experiences with it. I grew up right outside of St. Louis um, on the Illinois side of the river and the town that I grew up in was had a very like say misunderstanding towards black people um, and so in elementary school as well there was comments made your your mom's white your dad's black so that makes you a b-word or um, you know, I don't really like black people except for you, Dresden, you're cool. And so I kind of hit from mm. the angle of I, the racism I experience is really just shocking people with, I'm not what you portray all black people to be. My dad is not what you portray black people to be. I remember a teacher specifically trying to compliment me because, oh, I've never seen a black man so well put together and what it just just things like that. So I think um, in the city that I grew up in, my family was, we saw the racism and, and we just met it head on to be an example um, of, you know, try not to be offended. You say the comments that you have to say, you, you give us the looks and all the things, similar experiences, um, and then just to keep proving them wrong. Um, so that's that's my experience with it. Mm. 
Yeah, I think at, like you, Dresden, for me, I grew up in the South, and, uh, and I, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was born in Dallas, Texas, but grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and, you know, I think um, I, I saw racism every week, you know, so it, my family is a God-honoring, uh, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing uh, family, and the idea of racism was uh, far from their minds and their hearts. However, I grew up in, in a racial tension uh, society, and uh, the, the teenage years were my most rebellious and dark years as a uh, person. I didn't know Jesus at the time. I was the story of the prodigal son. And in high school at the time, it's when gangs were going everywhere. I mean, it was gang banging country, you know, and all the youth and the culture was all driven towards the gangs. So I was a bad kid. I mean, I was a, I was actually a, a drug dealer at one time. I would also sell stolen merchandise, and I was a little entrepreneur for the devil. <laughs> and so my, my, my dad would say, uh, as, a, as, I, as I go back to Arkansas now, he'll say, guys, this is my son. He used to walk with the devil, but now he lives with the Lord, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so I'm telling you, like, I, I was mixed up, and I had KKK. Uh, friends that I didn't know were KKK. Um, I had friends that were in the Bloods and the Crips community. Um, and I'm, I have to stay pretty neutral if my business was going to thrive, you know. And so I had to learn as an early teenager, you know, how to navigate these racial tensions. But even from an ethical standpoint, I knew that this was wrong. I remember uh, my grandfather who uh, came out of California when my dad tells me stories and my grandfather told me stories. He op operated a business down in, in, in uh, right outside of Dallas, uh, Rockwall, Texas. It was a manufacturing company for paints and whatnot. He came from California and he got down there and realized, oh my goodness, we're in the racist South. Like, this is crazy. And uh, he said, well, he told his management that he wanted to hire and this is back in the in the in the fifties, in the forties, uh, or, or 50, uh, yeah, fifties and forties. And then he told his management that he wanted to hire um, some African Americans, uh, some Latinos, and and some ladies in some management positions. And they said to him, "If you're going to do that, you found the wrong uh, company. You, you need to pack your bags and go back to California." And he said, "I will. See you later." So he's literally going back towards California, he's get, making plans. They call him back and say, you got six months, try it out. So he hired all these people and he ended up having the industry standard from there on in, the, in, in, in Texas uh, for that company. And uh, I grew up with that heroic mindset. Like that's who we are as a Rice family. Like we're gonna stand up for this junk. And even as a non-Christian, I could see it all the time. I mean, I remember creeks that I would go swim by, there would be a black leprechaun with a noose tied up in the top of a tree. I remember stories of kids that were uh, uh, people that were killed, and then they would hang them and then take them to remote areas back in, in Arkansas and, and, and for a showcase. So this whole concept of people saying racism is dead, I'm like, Sorry, you haven't been where I've been, you know, like, no, it's alive and thriving, you know, and I was invited to the Klan rally. Uh, I was by a member of the KKK when I was about uh, 17, 18 years old and was told to join the rally and I could become a part of their clan. I'm like, no way. So I've seen it myself and it grieves my heart, you know, and so much of the joy of moving out west as a southerner is seeing less of it, but I still see it. Not to the same degree, not near as organized, but I still see it, you know. So Andy, you share your, your part. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks for having us, Ryan, yeah. and for giving us this platform uh, to speak. But um, yeah, I mean, my, my, I can go back, right? <laughs> There's been too many, uh, uh, occurrences, you know, to, to list out here, but my youngest goes back to when I was like seven or eight years old. Um, but what I, you know, I've, I've had run-ins with the police, you fit the description, you know, um, all of that. Um, the one I decided to share today was more recent. It was probably uh, four or five months ago, uh, picking up my son from his, uh, from a birthday party he went to um, 
at a friend's house, and uh, it was before all of this quarantine and everything, of course. Um, so uh, I arrived at the party, and it was all kids except for the parents, of course, and uh, they had a couple of friend, friends of theirs, I suppose. Um, uh, just from walking in, uh, the male friend, not the parent, uh, was just looking at me awkward. And uh, I didn't know why he was looking at me funny. I thought maybe he's just trying to figure me out, like, uh, what is my race? You know, I get that often because I am mixed uh, black and Mexican. Um, or, you know, maybe he thinks he knows me from somewhere. Um, <clears throat> but uh, he, he continued to look at me as I was having a conversation with the parents. And so eventually I asked him, uh, I said, hey, you look a little familiar. Do you, do you live around the area? Um, and he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, around. And I was like, oh, okay, do you live in Fireside? Um, that's where, where we live. <laughs> um, and he says, uh, yeah, you know, and but it, it was a yeah, like, you know, I'm not going to tell you where I live. Like, just leave me alone. And so at that point, I realized, you know, what this guy's problem was. And so, uh, so you know, my response immediately was kind of like, I, I was... Uh, put off a bit. I didn't know exactly how to respond initially. And I think I just said, wow, you know, because there was like an awkward silence after he said, yeah, because I think even the parents of my son's friends <laughs> realized, you know, his his response wasn't, you know, a typical response. So um, I just said, wow. And so, you know, I gra got my son and said, okay, it's time to go. <clears throat> and we left. So, um, you know, the point of it is, is you know, racism comes in all sorts of different forms. It's not always flat out, you know, racial slurs, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just uh, a treatment that's not, not fair or not deserved or just unequal, you know, like, you know, my, my immediate response is anger and hate and I want to retaliate. Like, what is your problem? You know, just go off on this guy. But, um, you know, um, <laughs> that's where being a Christian comes in, you know, I respond as, as the Lord would have us respond, you know, in love and, um, uh, you know, try, try to put that, that anger at bay and all that. So, uh, yeah, that, like, again, that was just my most recent experience and that wasn't far off. So, you know, as he said, racism is not dead. It's far from it. It's not isolated to these remote parts of, you the know, South the country. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's everywhere. And, as Ryan said, you know, it's almost a daily basis. Fortunately, it has not been daily for me. <laughs> I don't know, but, you know, it is it is there, and it's evident, and it's clear. And, um, you know, I would ask people, I've shared stories with people, uh, you know, white friends or whatnot, and, and they're more dismissive, you know, like, oh, that's not racism, you know. But uh, when you've experienced it your whole life growing up, you, you know it. Um, and so, you know, if, if somebody's sharing something with you, you know, don't be dismissive about it, you know, be, listen, uh, be open-minded. Um, you know, that would be my, my yeah. request. Yeah. And I, I think that one of the things that I've, I've had discussions with you guys at some level, but is, as, uh, yeah, I've seen in the white community is, um, white fragility. It's the idea that there's kind of this, uh, frustration or annoyance when an African American or, black man says that you know says something or or woman says something about race or brings up like why you got to bring race into this mm -hmm. you know like i've seen that among wh white people and it's this fragileness about the conversation that they just like I, that i've learned uh, a sociologist i guess have termed it that or a psychologist whatever but they've termed it this concept of white fragility and i see that and i think we need to be you know take on the axiom idea as a white community of, you know, feedback is the breakfast of champions, like, like gain feedback, like, or how about just a more biblical idea, like quick to listen, slow to speak, you know, and um, it's, I was talking to uh, some pastor, white pastors, black pastors, uh, white theologians, black theologians, and one of the white theologians said something like this regarding this conversation about race. He said something like, Ryan, I'm really glad you guys are addressing it. I think it's important as a church that you gather uh, black men and women from your church and have them listen. And I said, well, that's exactly what we're doing. And he said, that's the greatest starting point. Because people need to hear, because let me tell you something, I'm white and I don't understand fully 
what's all the details behind it. However, what I am clear on is the Bible and theology. And clearly, all forms of racism are an absolute violation to Scripture. And we need to protect that and figure out together how to implement that, you know. So I guess in a follow-up question from what you guys just shared, I mean, and I know you have more, a lot more experiences because I've heard and you've shared with me many of those. Um, but for time's sake, w- why don't we transition into the, the question about how has a relationship with Jesus Christ help you heal or deal with it, you know, with the, 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 the struggle that you've undergone? Well, for myself, um, I've, I've learned to, um, to pray more. Um, there's more that can be done by prayer than you can do by yourself. And um, that is a learned behavior. Uh, coming from Detroit, born on the east side, um, you know, fighting and, and, and being angry was, was almost a um, second nature for me. Uh, but thank God for his salvation, mm-hmm. whereas that he was able to change me and because of that, now it doesn't take away what has happened, but now my response is different. So I am able to talk intelligently to an individual and still give my point across and yet go back and pray in reference to what had happened to me that it don't happen to any others, you know. So that 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 to me is a, a big major point in my salvation and, and how now I'm able to deal with it. Even when I see the things on television, you know, um, I'm hurt by it. Uh, but I know that I may not necessarily have the time to go march, but I definitely have the time to go pray. Mm. And that, I feel, is my job as a Christian. Mm. Yes. Mm. And you're doing this 4th of July, gathering with your wife, yes. praying. Yes, for our country. Exactly. Normally yeah. we would, you know, hang out in somebody's backyard and barbecue the whole nine. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but we, we, this is a time that, that we will have together. Uh, we're both off work and uh, we're going to utilize this time in order to do our parts as Christians. And that's pray for this society, pray for this world. The Bible says that if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal the land. So we have to do our part in order to ask God to do his part. Yeah. And you're a, you're a Marine. You, yes. you, you have served our country. You um, love our country. And, and yet you see the need to engage the spiritual problem. Most definitely. And I, and I think that is so core and central. And as a church, that's what I'm calling you to, is to engage a spiritual issue. Not the political issues, not everything else. But remember, like I said last week, the fight behind the fight. The fight behind the fight is this sin issue. The sin issue has infected our, our world like a virus, and it, it manifests itself in racism. Yes. And that's where we have to contend for major core doctrines of theology like the creation of humanity, the Latin phrase, the Imago Dei, all people are made in God's image. And that's what we're going to address as a church, building that biblical theological foundation so that you can have better more biblical-based responses into all this, and you attacking it in the spiritual realm, I think, is vital. And and thank you for praying for our country. Thank you for praying for our church, too. Yeah. For me, it's... I'm definitely not healing from it, but Christ has been my anchor to deal with it in a different situation mm-hmm. or a different way, mm. such as praying or just having conversations with people. Mm. Um, if I didn't have Christ in my life, I definitely would would have been one of those individuals that was, were going crazy just for the fact that I've dealt with this my whole life. Um, and my ho- whole life, we've we've been saying that this stuff has been happening and it's kind of been swept under the rug. And now that it's out now, um, I'm happy. I pray that we just continue to educate and uh, people are continuing, continue to listen. That's the biggest thing. Um, but, you know, I believe it was Psalms 37, 28. It says God loves justice. So as a Christian, we should just all come together on one, as one, um, to 
make sure that all people are getting justice. And, yeah. and that's the most important thing. Um, so praying has helped me a lot. Um, and just having open conversation has helped a lot. Just I love having conversations with individuals that uh, don't know what's going on or have no idea. And me being able to educate them um, lets me know that, you know, they will pass that information on to individuals that are in the same, um, that don't know as well, you know, and yeah, that's, you know, one of the, you, one thing that you said, you talked about the, uh, this, this call for justice, you know, that uh, addressing justice and, and I, and I want us as a church to evaluate what does social justice look like? And is there a difference between social justice and biblical justice? You know, but be certain of this, that Jesus spoke about justice. I mean, in the synagogue, when he, uh, uh, the inauguration, the kickoff of his ministry, he walks in and says, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim freedom uh, for the poor or uh, good news to the poor and freedom for the oppressed. And then he says to the Pharisees, which is so challenging to me, and, and growing up in the racial South, um, getting a good education, going and getting a uh, bachelor's degree in business, going and getting two master's degrees at Dallas Theological Seminary, being educated, becoming a born-again, strong Christian man, raised in these great environments, but yet seeing all the, the discouragement and the division within racism, I feel like I've missed something. Because in the last you know, month or so, I feel like I'm re having to relearn, and I'm like, Lord, is there a hole in my holiness? Is there something missing in me? And I found this passage of scripture and it really convicted me, but he says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This is Jesus. For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, such as justice and mercy. And I asked myself, and I poised this question to some pretty brilliant minds. I said, is it possible that perhaps we've neglected weightier matters? Is it perhaps possible as a white evangelical churches across America that we've kind of, we've got a hole in our holiness, you know, in, in some of these areas? And because the reality as a Christian, we're all going to have to face judgment before Jesus Christ. And we're going to have to answer for the issues that we're dealing with in our culture. And I felt like as an American culture, as a church, we've done pretty well fighting abortion, fighting for, you know, um, a marriage between a man and a woman. But this justice issue and racial equality, it's a harder issue. And so you share your part about he, how has the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the relationship with Jesus Christ helped you heal with it or deal with it? Yeah, uh, for me, as far as personally, it's helped to give me an identity. My identity is in Christ. Um, growing up, you know, I'm, I'm too black for the white kids, too white for the black kids, kind of dealt with rejection. Um, growing up because of my skin color or because of the texture of my hair or whatever. Um, and so when you hear that as your brain is developing, as you're growing up, that really just um, roots something deep in you, uh, from rejection. And so as I meditate on the word, as I get in the word and understand that my identity is in Christ, um, I can begin to love myself again. I can, and then I can begin to love others. Um, so that's personally how Christ has impacted me, um, and what I, what I've taken away and how I, how I use my relationship with Christ to hit this issue. Yeah. Down. yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, for me, first and foremost, is, is forgiveness. <clears throat> um, forgiveness is the start of any healing process, I believe. Um, so, you know, whether they're asking for it or not, I know the Bible doesn't teach so much on just one side of forgiveness, but <laughs> I have to uh, forgive that other half, even though they're not asking for it. They may even not realize that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I have to forgive them because um, I am forgiven. You know, um, and I think that helps me move on. It helps me. Um, I, I need to see them as God's child. They still are God's creation. Um, um, you know, they are the image of God. So I need to, I just, for the, the carnal response is anger, right? And 
and hate. Um, so, um, yeah, Christianity is the, the exact opposite of those things, right? It's love, um, it's forgiveness, and uh, it's humility. So, um, yeah, trying to be humble and uh, not be prideful. I don't deserve to be talked to this way. I don't deserve to be treated this way. Um, you know, it's uh, so it's more of a dealing maybe than than so much healing. But um, yeah, that's I think that's for me how how Christianity has just really been an anchor, been the foundation um, in in all of this situation. And I think that is so crucial. And I, I mean, I'm thinking like, as you're talking, I'm like, this is why he's an elder, you know, <laughs> like what godly maturity to experience such assaults of the, of the human dignity and then to rise above it and forgive. I mean, that's just Jesus like, you know, when Jesus says, father, forgive them for they do not what they do. And honestly, I think that's what a lot of what goes on in American culture. I think there's a blanket of ignorance in so many realms, you know, like I, I would, I'm going to encourage our, 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 my, my white tribe, you know, to like go learn black history, you know, like, because I just saw a news report recently talking about how African Americans weren't slaves. They were just immigrants. And I'm like, did, did you really try to do that in the educational system? I'm like, give me a break. Like, there's a difference. Immigrants don't come here in chains, you know, and put on boats and then use for pieces of property. Like that's a different story. So let's, let's, let's like my, my deal is I'm trying to think through, I'm like, Lord, I love our country. We don't need, I, in my mind, we don't need a revolution. We need a reformation. We need a reformation of the heart. We need a reformation of the home. We need to uh, increase our learning. Like during the reformation in church history, it was a time of like, studying the scriptures, getting the Bible to people. And I'm thinking like, that's what we need. And part of what you said too, I think is an important lesson about your forgiveness thing, which is amazing. Um, and it shows the godliness in you, but is as Christians, we're, we've got to be a pipeline for forgiveness, not a pool. And I think too many times what we do in the Christian circles, whether it be a race issue or not, but forgiveness issue is we want God's forgiveness to come to us and it pulls up. Mm. But God's not calling us to be a pool of forgiveness. He's asking us to be a pipeline of forgiveness. Get that stuff out, man. And uh, you doing that is just incredible, you know. Yeah, if I may add on the educational piece, you know, I, I think that uh, our school education system doesn't do much justice for black history. You know, they, they touch on it, um, but it's not they don't really get into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, you know, um, when it comes to, uh, something we can do as individuals, you know, in our community and our, just in our home is educate our own families, uh, on black history as much as possible, possible. Um, watch a movie, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of good movies. Um, name one or two, a, if you don't oh, mind, man, I put just, you on the spot. Just, yeah. Just this most recent one that I enjoyed was just mercy. Um, you know, that was, uh, I mean, it was just key. It shows how the police had the authority. And this was just in the 80s, you know, uh, had the authority to arrest a black male uh, because, you know, somebody accused him, you know, a false witness. <clears throat> and I may be spoiler alert. <laughs> right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no, but um, uh, true story. And then um, uh, Talk to Me was another one um, uh, with Don Cheadle. That's an older movie, but... Um, um, you know, also shows just what happened in society and um, how it affects individual um, individuals in, in the culture, you know, uh, with the riots and everything else. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good way to educate. And so, yeah, it's Hollywood. But, um, you know, children today, I know my kids don't enjoy reading books. <laughs> so, you know, watch a movie is a good yeah. way to, to show our children what, what happened and what black people have been dealing with um, forever, yeah. you know. You know, I think of another movie, uh, Amazing Grace, uh, the story of William Wilberforce. It's an awesome movie. It's where we get the, 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 origin, the story behind the story of the Amazing Grace song that we sing and perhaps one of the most popular, powerful um, songs that we have sung uh, cross-generationally mm. and cross-racially. Uh, is that song Amazing Grace, the story of William Wilberforce and, and uh, uh, John Newton. 
uh, in that. So, yeah. yeah. Even dealing with um, with um, Black history, my mind went back to uh, growing up in the Detroit public school system, and um, we we had our time. That was the month of February, mm -hmm. you know. And looking back now, I know that Black history is American history, you know. But they allowed us to, you know, just deal with black history for the entire month of February, which is the shortest month of the year. And then when March 1st come, we're taking our final and we're done, you know? And uh, now what else? I mean, you can't impact, you can't, you can't unpack black history in a month. It's mm -hmm. just impossible. Mm -hmm. So um, I would love to see black history incorporated in American history. Right. And then it's, it's just, you know, across the board. Right. So, you know, um, again, this is hindsight, you know, and I'm like, wow, I was just happy that we got a month, you know. Now as an adult, I'm like, wait a minute, something's wrong here, right. you know. So yeah. what would you guys say as, like, what do you hope that we accomplish, even in our church or perhaps even on a grander scale, our country, you know, as a result of having this conversation? Because my guess is, is, you know, there's a lot of God-honoring men and women out there that are going to be starting to say, you know what, we've got to have conversations. And they're doing what we're doing right now all across our country. And But what is what is your hope kind of for this generation that we learn and, and perhaps uh, learn from all this? Well, you said it earlier, um, slow to speak and quick to listen. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has a story to tell. And if you just listen to their story that should bring a little empathy in reference to what they might be going through. Um, you don't necessarily have to judge every person based on a cookie cutter, you know. Um, if, if we do that, not only as a church but as a nation, I really feel like healing can begin. But, we, but it has to start just by listening, you know. Um, that's, that's an awesome thing for that to be in the Word of God mm -hmm. because that's something that we need to practice. And it is a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't come natural because everybody want to talk. Everybody got something to say. But how often do you listen? Mm -hmm. If you can reverse the two, listen more and speak less, then I think that's the beginning of mm -hmm. healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I would say this is a charge for Christians to really understand and recognize the battle that we're fighting. Um, I personally have been studying, I've been wrestling with the word on this um, a lot. There's a lot that you see in the news. There's a lot that you see in the media and I get triggered and I say, when I became a Christian, I adopted the mind of Christ. So whenever I get tr triggered in order to not operate carnally, like you were talking about before, I'm going to the word. And so I've been wrestling with it. And Galatians 3, Paul, it, it, that whole, if you guys just study that, um, he's really helping people understand who have this mindset that Jews are better than Gentiles. Um, and that's a deep-rooted Even what we're facing today is similar situation as in Bible times. It's the same spirit is the same thing that we're fighting against um, that we see this classification of people mm -hmm. and the way Paul handles it um, he's reminding them that in Christ there's no Jew there's no Gentile there's no slave mm -hmm. or free there's no male or female um, and then he approaches it by using their original text so he's he's using their what they believe in and what they go forth and preach and um, and He's not adding anything new to it. He's not changing anything. He's using what they are using to make their argument that Jews are better to say, hey, you're missing a piece here. Mm. Um, God gave us a promise that through faith um, mm. and through his son Christ, we are all children of God now. Mm. And so you might have an argument based on Old Testament or law, but also in that same law, God's, God reveals a promise and that the law is only going to be um, what we operate under mm. until Christ's coming. And then we move into grace. So you might have an argument of why you, because as humans, we classify things. We classify AirPods. I, you, you're always getting the bigger, better, and what one's better than the other. Um, and we do the same with humans. And mm. I think our fight um, is when we leave out this in Christ part, when we're fighting for equality and there's no male, there's no female, and doesn't matter about skin color. You're fighting for equality. This is great. Do not leave out Christ. Um, I think the en enemy kind of subtly takes truth and leaves parts out of it to um, cause division 
And so if we can come together as Christians, really look at examples that the Bible gave us. And Paul in Galatians 3 is a good one, mm. dealing with the same mindset that mm. we're dealing with with people of today. Um, and he uses their scripture, what they believe mm -hmm. in, to point out their flaws and really challenge them to uphold. You mm -hmm. say you believe in this, mm -hmm. uphold what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And in Christ, we are equal. Don't leave mm -hmm. out the in Christ mm -hmm. part. Um, so the fight is to make sure we're spreading the gospel the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what I hope we take away from this is we get really fired up about, Hey, there is equality. Like I'm not disagreeing with you, but let's remember it's under the blood of Jesus. It's in Christ that we have that. So mm. that's what we should preach. And that's mm. what we should march forward on to, to be in unity and, and, and protect our unity in that manner. Mm. So that's where I'm at with it. That's what I hope I know. to share. Isn't that good? Um, and I hope, uh, I want to see revival That's why I put in her in the middle. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, yeah. and I, what I love about what you're saying is exactly the heartbeat of where I want to help North Valley is let's just get deeper rooted in scripture and have a stronger underpinning of understanding biblically and theologically about the the unity that is essential in the church you know that the unity i mean the fight like i said last week in the division talk about the unity was the cry of the early church i mean the apostle paul and peter the two apostles getting fights over this stuff you know and there's a the council of jerusalem and in the book of acts is about these racial tensions like this is no new fight it's an old fight but it's a fight that's so crucial to have, and, and may it be in North Valley and other churches, too, that this becomes the place, the sacred place, where we, we can find unity and diversity in the mix of it all, you know. And I love how you're rooted in Scripture. That's so cool. So for you, Elder Andy or Ryan, go ahead. What do you hope that comes out of this? More unity. Yeah. Um, that's the biggest thing, more unity and just um, individuals educating themselves, um, being open to conversation. Um, a lot of uh, people are on social media, so I think that can misconstrue everything going on. Uh, my biggest thing is just letting people know this is not a political issue. It has Politics has nothing to do with this. It's a humanity mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, a certain... Black people aren't being treated fair in this world. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great documentary on uh, Netflix called The 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suggest everyone watch that. It, it, I learned a lot from watching it that I didn't know mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just the biggest thing is, is people educating themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. We're going to do a lot of that. We're going to do a lot of education, and, and the Bible will be the source book. So I'll be good. What about you? What would you say? Yeah, I would um, echo what everybody has already said. Listen, yeah. educate, unify. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the three things that we need to do. Um, in terms of unity, you know, I think we can apply. There's an acronym I learned. I've shared it with mm -hmm. you before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called THINK. Think before you speak or maybe on social media. Think before you post. Mm -hmm. um, think, you know, um, the acronym is the T is, uh, is it true? Ask yourself, is mm. what you're about to post true? Mm. Is the H is, is it helpful? Um, mm. is, is it going to help anybody? Um, is it inspiring? Is the I. Uh, the N is, is it necessary? Mm. And the K is, is it kind? Is um, it kind? Yeah. If you can, if you could think before you post, you know, um, you're less likely to cause division, mm. you know, um, <clears throat> everybody has a story, like Ella said, but everybody also has an opinion. Um, and sometimes, you know, that opinion <laughs> may not be helpful. It may cause the division that uh, that may not be what we desire ultimately. Yeah, and kindness isn't cool in today's culture. No. You and know, awesome. and I, yet it is a fruit of the Spirit. You know, and so I think that's so, so timely in your word in that. I think people will probably be rewinding to get that think- a uh, little acronym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let me pray for us and thank thank you guys for, for being here today. This is the beginning, and uh, I want to teach to our church uh, a longer series and a biblical theological foundation for unity. And, uh, and if we are Christians, you know, we live 
underneath the Word of God, you know, and not over it. And uh, the authority of Scripture plays a critical role, and I think that, you know, this education part, and my encouragement is the practical is, is in the conversation, is, is getting into conversations with folks and realizing feedback is the breakfast for champions, letting people speak into the situation, you know. So let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the voices represented here on this stage as people who love our church and love our country, Lord, but hurt. And Lord, may we, as the scripture says, there's a time to rejoice and there's a time to mourn. And Father, so many of these times are all blurred in between. And I pray that as the Apostle Paul talked about, making the best use of the time that we would do that in today's culture and in this church. Lord, to you be all the glory in this church and in the churches around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.